Shalom and welcome to Temple Talk. This is Yitzhak Ruven speaking to you from south of Jerusalem. Today is the seventh day of the month of Nisan, 5783. It is March 28th, 2023, and this coming Shabbat we are reading Parashat Tzav, the second parasha, the second Torah reading in the book of Leviticus. Tzav begins in the book of Leviticus, chapter 6, verse 1, concludes chapter 8, verse 36. And it is all about korbanot. It's all about offerings. We were talking in depth about offerings last week. Um, And I have some more to say about offerings uh, this week. And I also would like to talk about the month of Nisan, because I think last week we were still in the month of Adar, the very final day or days of Adar. So now we're in the month of Nisan, which is the first of our months. How do we know that? Because in uh, Exodus chapter 12, Hashem tells Moshe to tell the people that this is the first of your months, that Israel was granted. uh, Actually, the first commandment that they received was the responsibility of of keeping time, in fact, uh, the responsibility of citing the new moon and declaring it and sanctifying the new moon and using the new moon as its system of calendar and using the new moon to determine when the holidays would be that Hashem soon would uh, share with them. Those holidays, of course, being Passover and Sukkot and Shavuot and Yom Kippur and... Rosh Hashanah and others and of course it was crucial for Israel on uh, at that moment in Egypt to determine the new moon because on the 15th and the 14th of that month they needed to uh, each family slaughter a lamb that he had that they had brought were told instructed to bring into their households on the 10th of the month and slaughtered on the 14th, that is the Korban Pesach, the Passover offering, to eat it on the night of the 15th, uh, which is to avoid any confusion. Uh, As you know, the Hebrew day begins in the evening. So today, before it was sunset, it was the 6th of Nisan, now, I'm actually recording this after the sun has gone down. And it's the seventh day, even though in the non-Hebrew calendar, it's still the same calendar day. It's still um, March 28th. It was when the sun shone, and now it's still March 28th now that the sun has gone down, but it is not the same in Hebrew, in the Hebrew calendar. So the the Passover offering, the Korban Pesach, is offered up on the 14th. And only after that, uh, after the sun goes down, it's the fifteenth. Is it, is it eaten, consumed at the, at the seder, at the seder meal? And today, being the seventh of Nisan, it means that next Tuesday evening begins the fourteenth. Means next Wednesday afternoon is the time that, that the Passover offering is to be offered. And then Wednesday evening will already be the beginning of the 15th of Nisan, and that is, of course, the day of the of Passover. Uh, it's a little confusing, and in fact, in the Torah itself, uh, sometimes the 14th is designated as Chag Pesach, because it's the day of the offering, uh, even though it doesn't have the other... Um, qualifications of a holiday. We it's it's a work day, even though that day should be dedicated only to doing what's necessary to f- finish preparations for for the seven days of Passover, which are referred to sometimes in the Torah as the the festival of matzot, because of course during uh, Passover we don't eat matzah. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, we don't eat chametz. Chametz is leavened bread or any product that may have any leavening substance in it. Um, and so 
those seven days are sometimes referred to as Chag Matzot in the Torah, and the day of the offering, the 14th, is sometimes referred to as Chag Pesach. But of course today uh, we refer to the seven days which began on the 15th as Pesach, Passover. Uh, Pesach literally means to pass over. It's a literal translation uh, because Hashem passed over the houses. He, the angel of, of death that he sent out to kill all the firstborn passed over all the houses uh, that uh, had been marked with blood on the lintel and doorposts, the blood of the lamb that was offered, the Passover offering. So that is the origin of the name. And we mentioned a little bit about about Nisan, and Nisan is um, really, in many ways, it is the most special month of the year. It's the first month, and it's the month of our redemption, our Gula, our march out of Egypt into freedom. And our sages say it will be the month of our of our future Gula or perhaps the completion of the process of Gula that, that I believe we have already begun, uh, that we're in that process and we're moving forward uh, steadily. Even when it seems like there's setbacks, we're still moving forward. Um, and that's Nisan. During Nisan, we certain um, prayers that we say every day uh, prayers of, I'm not sure how to describe them, but um, less than, let's just put it this way, uh, to give you a, the essence of, of, of what it's about, less than uh, joyful prayers, uh, and more uh, pr- say prayers of uh, beseeching Hashem. Um, we don't say during the month of, of Nisan because it's all, the entire month is considered to have a higher elevated status. Uh, and of course, we're super busy right now, getting ready for Passover. Um, by now, uh, many households here in Israel, and I'm sure many Jewish households, observant households around the world, have already turned their houses inside out, getting things ready, uh, cleaning any chametz, uh, scrubbing kitchens, and uh, putting away things that we won't be using during Passover, and soon we'll be taking things out that we that we reserve for Passover. Um, uh, many Jewish households have uh, completely separate separate uh, flatware and separate dishes and, and glasses and everything for Passover. Uh, some households even have a separate kitchen that they use only during Passover. It's a holiday that uh, we take very seriously, but of course it is a very joyful holiday. And the height of the holiday is the Seder, which is on the first night, which in which we read the Haggadah, which is the telling of the Exodus, with a lot of other uh, midrashic insights and stories. And really it's sort of a guidebook. Um, you can read it um, straight through at the table and you will have uh, fulfilled the mitzvah of the Haggadah or you can read it and add all sorts of your own thoughts and insights and, and add all your own stories to it. But the important thing and the important thing that the Torah says over and over and over again is teach your children how you left Egypt. So there's two things here. One is the main focus of the Haggadah, the main fo- focus of the Seder night, with all the different symbolic foods that we eat, etc., etc., is to teach our children, our children, our children's children. That's what we need to do. And what are we teaching? Not that once upon a time, a few thousand years ago, Hashem uh, performed all these miracles on behalf of our ancestors and and brought them out of Egypt and brought them up to Mount Sinai and eventually brought them into the land of Israel, etc., etc. That in itself is amazing, but even more so, Hashem brought us out of Egypt. We are part of the Exodus story. We are part of that generation. We have to relive it. Our souls were there. We're told that all our souls were at Sinai that every every Jewish soul was at Sinai receiving the Torah that's why it's 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 a part of us even before we 
we we learn it as 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 children or as adults it's part of us in fact we're told by our sages that an infant in its mother's womb is 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 taught the entire torah from start to finish and moments before he is born he or she is born emerges from the womb uh, an angel taps the infant un yet unborn infant on its lip lips causing the yet unborn infant to forget the entire torah what would that be why shouldn't we be born with the knowledge with, with knowing everything well we are uh, we are we we are made to forget it so that we will pursue it so that we will learn it and as we learn it it's all familiar because it was there once before it's part of us we just have to really relearn it and how do we know that the angel struck us on the lip because of that little uh, indentation above our lip right right above the lip under the nose is a little I don't know what you want to call it a cleft I don't know an indentation that is the sign that's the mark that the angel left so if you see someone that doesn't have that which I've never actually seen then I would guess it would mean that the angel um, uh, didn't get to them and I would uh, if I met someone like that I would ask some questions to see if they have the still retain the entire knowledge of the entire Torah but uh, Getting back to our subject, we need to teach our children and our children's children and anyone at the at the Seder table uh, that we we left Egypt. Hashem brought us out of Egypt. Hashem blessed us with freedom. Uh, it has to be our experience. It has to be our memory. And... Um, uh, that's a challenge and that's an inspiration and among the other things that we eat and drink uh, on the Passover Seder are four uh, glasses of wine each one representing another expression of redemption of Geula uh, that's mentioned in the Torah itself and of course we have matzah and we have bitter herbs which is mentioned specifically uh, in Exodus 12 we eat bitter herbs to represent the bitterness of our of our enslavement and there are many other symbolic uh, foods that we eat and ultimately the most important um, culinary aspect of the Seder is one that we don't eat today and that's the Korban Pesach. That's the, the Passover offering. And um, we eat other things as a remembrance of the offering, but we're not performing the offering, which is, at the very least, is a shame. Uh, maybe it's a crime. Maybe it's a sin. Um for well over 100, maybe 150 years uh, when Jews began returning in large numbers to the land of Israel and communities began to grow in Israel, um, many top rabbis, top sages began to discuss whether we have the obligation in the current situation, current even going back 150 years to bring the Passover offering. And the unanimous uh, uh, agreement is, yes, we do have the obligation. Now, in normal times, um, nobody even goes up to the inner areas of the where the temple stood unless they have already been purified of the purification of Tomei Meit having come in contact with a corpse and that of course can only happen with the red heifer with the ashes of the red heifer which we still don't have hopefully soon uh, yet the halakha uh, the ruling is that if the majority of Israel is not pure of that level of purity 
then it does not prevent the bringing of the of the Passover offering that that aspect is 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 pushed off that year so that's not holding us back and the proper way to do the offering is to is that it be brought onto the temple mount and that it's the blood of the offering be dashed against the altar so the other requirement is an altar and again an a, a temporary small scale altar can be built very quickly on the Temple Mount. There's nothing uh, where the altar needs to stand. There's nothing there right now. It's an empty area. And um, and then it could be removed immediately after. So the only there's only two things really that are preventing us today from bringing the Passover offering. And one is the government, which has never sanctioned it and um, it would seem to have to be a real sea change in consciousness before uh, government of Israel would sanction sanction the Passover offering but you know we still hope it will happen soon and the other is and this is part and parcel really of the same of the same thing um, how much the people want to do it now there are many uh, observant Jews that very much would like to bring the Passover offering and not only would like to but they see it as an obligation a very serious obligation that we're very that uh, it's not it's not okay that we're we're not performing the the Passover offering it, it's really we're really missing missing something here and yeah, on the other hand there are many people who uh, you know, it's not so important, uh, just as uh, well without it, who needs the trouble, etc., etc. So, again, working on the consciousness of our people and, and, and trying to uh, educate and, and, and trying to shine a light on why these things are so important and so uplifting. Um, I've told it in the past... And I'll tell it again right now. There are uh, three different times over the past years, maybe the past 10 years, um, that uh, I and a friend of mine actually purchased a lamb uh, that we that we had slaughtered by a, a professional qualified uh, shochet slaughterer, kosher slaughterer, on actually on the 14th of Nisan. Each time we did it on the 14th. And it uh, it wasn't a korban pesach. No, it wasn't a Passover offering because the blood was not dashed on the altar. Um, but it was nevertheless a, an incredibly moving experience. It's a very serious, serious undertaking, which um, I, it, like I it just lifted us up and sort of carried it. it gained a momentum of its own um, and actually one of those times uh, I actually uh, had the lamb brought to my house uh, and it, it stayed with us in our backyard for a few days and we received it actually on the 10th of the month of Nisan. Now the 10th of the month of Nisan is the day uh, in Egypt, in that first Passover in Egypt that that Israel was commanded to acquire a, a lamb, and they were commanded to keep that lamb actually in the house. We're told uh, to keep the, to guard over it for the for the next four days until they would slaughter it. Well, we didn't keep it in the house; we kept it just outside. It uh, was pretty noisy and rambunctious, so sometimes it seemed like it was right in the house with us. Um, it was yes, I say it was very rambunctious, very frisky. It was a very lively lamb. And um, on the 14th, uh, a shochet and his young son came to slaughter the lamb in our backyard. Um, a couple of uh, friends who were very curious and interested uh, joined us. And um, we had to hold the lamb down and I held the lamb by its horns and my friend held it by the back legs that's how it's done and the 
the lamb was facing Jerusalem. And at the time, we were living just east of Jerusalem. And directly in front of us was the Mount of Olives. And right on the other side of that was the Temple Mount. So the Lamb and we all were facing Jerusalem, all were facing the Temple Mount. And uh, when, the, when the moment came, when the deed to be done, the most amazing thing occurred the lamb stretched out its neck, stretched out its neck toward Jerusalem. And it was, I'm telling you, I'm not making this up. It was as if the lamb was was saying, take me, let's do this. At that moment, I think the lamb was more, was more into it even than I was or my friend was. And it's an experience that I say over and over because it's unforgettable experience. And why am I sharing it? Because when we talk about offerings, when we talk about these things, you know, it's who wants to talk about it? You know, it's blood and it's guts and it's killing an animal. And it, it can be very, you know, uninspiring or, or seem almost cruel or distasteful. But when you're actually there and doing something so serious, because it really is all those things, it really is a serious, serious thing, you really are taking a life. Um, when you do, you, you are accepting upon yourself a huge responsibility, a huge responsibility because you, you're not playing games here. You're doing this because you're doing it for a holy reason before because you're doing it as part of your relationship with Hashem because you're doing it with as an expression of your faith in Hashem you can't mess around here you know it's a much more serious thing than you know than uh, throwing a burger on the barbecue and, and having and having dinner that doesn't require a whole lot of 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 thought or consciousness we just do it you know we're hungry our our bodies are telling us you want to eat this in this case an offering a tremendous amount of of integrity and and seriousness and thought and and you know really you know you really think about who you are like why am i doing this and and you know, am I really worthy of doing this? And who am I to be be taking this animal's life? Again, you know, we 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 who consume meat, you know, obviously don't think about these things usually. But when you are there, um, you know, right there in the front seat, and you're the one who 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 has purchased this lamb and you're the one who is has decided this lamb's fate and you are an active part in carrying out that fate yeah it's a very 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 uh sobering thing you know there's no games here there's no lightheadedness so that's what i'm trying to get across that that this whole practice this whole custom, this whole um, ritual of, of offerings is very serious stuff. And, you know, even though it was carried out on a daily basis in the temple, it was not taken lightly. And It has to be done with with utmost sincerity. Otherwise, otherwise it's not a, it's not a korban. Otherwise, your offering is not a valid offering. You haven't accomplished anything except, actually, um, you know, perhaps you've transgressed again. Um, so sincerity and integrity and purpose and intention are the you know real active ingredients. In, in performing an offering pr in a proper way. And again, you know, in my experience, it wasn't an offering. It was, you know, it was um, sort of a, 
a wannabe with with the realization that it wasn't you know we weren't pretending that it was but being that it was uh, intended to be eaten that evening and being that uh, it was intended to be a, a zecher you know a a memorial or a remembrance of of the offering it was uh, very very serious and very very meaningful and again we we did it a few more times after that um and each time is serious stuff you know very very serious stuff and that i believe is is really the the essence intended to be the essence of the passover uh holiday and after that we have the seven days of eating matzah which is itself is you know also a very you know, serious undertaking to clean your house out and to get all the chametz out, all the all the crumbs, and uh, you know, and of course it's very symbolic of cleaning our heads out, you know, cleaning our souls out. Like once a year, just do a spring cleaning of the soul. You know, freshen yourself up, tidy yourself up, get rid of all the old, get rid of all the crumbs, get all of you know. Leaven is always you know the rising uh, of of leavening. Of, of, of you know yeast and leavening agents it also is seen as being symbolic of of pride of of hubris right we get full of ourselves we we you know puff out our chest we make ourselves big uh, we forget we forget that uh, we have a God and that we're his children and that uh, we are all equal and that all that we have is because of Hashem, and then all that we achieve is with Hashem's blessing. And a little humility um, goes a long way. A little humility can can get us out of Egypt. A little humility can can release us from a lot of enslavement, uh, self enslavement. You know, we get connected to things, whether it's our work, whether it's. Um, you know certain things that we that we do, and we just get so caught up in it that uh, we sort of um, become slaves uh, to what we're what we're doing, and we forget that um, that we're intended to be free people, and that our ultimate authority and our only authority ultimately is Hashem. So that. Is all about Passover, and I've been uh, myself very busy with getting things ready in the house for Passover. Um, hopefully, not to the neglect of my other responsibilities. Uh, uh, let's talk about Parshat Sav. Parshat Sav, which again begins in chapter. 6 verse 1 of the book of Leviticus. It concludes chapter 8 verse 36. And let's um, look at the first few verses in Hebrew and then in English. Um, Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, command Aaron, tzav is command, right? You hear the word mitzvah, mitzvah is a commandment, tzav is command. It's the command form of command. Command Aaron and his sons, saying, this is the law of the burnt offering. It is the burnt offering that stays on the flame, on the altar, all night until the morning, and the fire of the altar should be kept aflame on it. The Kohen the priest, the Kohen, shall don his fitted linen tunic, and he shall don linen breeches on his flesh. He shall separate the ash of what the fire consumed of the burnt offering on the altar and place it next to the altar. He shall remove his garments and don other garments, and he shall remove the ash to the outside of the camp to a pure place. The fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not be extinguished. And the Kohen shall kindle wood upon it every morning. He shall prepare the burnt offering upon it and shall cause the fats of the peace offering to go up in a smoke upon it. A permanent fire shall remain aflame on the altar and shall not be extinguished. Um, 
So what we're being instructed here concerning the burnt offering is that the day following the burnt offering, the morning following the burnt offering, which has been on the altar all night long, and the next day is nothing but ashes, that the first responsibility, the first task in the morning is for a Kohen to, to ascend the altar and clean up, gather up all the ashes with a shovel, put it in a special vessel, and bring that down. And, um, and there's a special place on the Temple Mount where the ashes are initially discarded. And so the idea is that you clean up yesterday's ashes before you then begin the new offering, the new uh, tamid, the new daily offering. So again, there's a wonderful lesson to be learned here, and it sort of coincides with what I was saying about Passover, and that is yesterday we made an offering. Yesterday that offering was everything. It was important. It was meaningful. It was part of our connection with the Shem, and it uh, was left burning on the altar fire all night long, as it was supposed to. And now it's a new day. And what was yesterday was yesterday, right? Um, so today the first thing we need to do is to clean it up, get ready for the new day. Yesterday's ashes belong to yesterday. We do it all over again. It's a new day. It's a new world. Every day God recreates the world. Every day is a brand new day, and every day... Uh, we make a new offering, and every day in our lives we we are new. You know, we we present ourselves in a new way. We we strive in a new way. We don't rest on our laurels. We don't say, "Well, yesterday uh, was a great day, so I'm just going to kick back and take it easy today." That's not the way to do it. Um, and we know, you know, I guess the biggest, the easiest metaphor is with sports. You know, you win a, a big game yesterday. And wow, it was a great victory, and that's great, but um, it's a new day and a new challenge. So yesterday's victory doesn't mean anything. Um, it's today's game that you need to focus on. So that's the a nice lesson of that's a nice lesson of uh, this first opening paragraph. In the book, uh, in the in Parsha Tzav, in the book of Leviticus, and the Parsha goes on to describe all the different types of offerings. Uh, that was the burnt offering, and then there's the meal offering, and the sin offering, and the guilt offering, and the and the the uh, peace offering, and uh, feast offering, etc., etc. There's different types of offerings. Each one is a little different, might have a different animal that's required, slightly different procedure for the Kohanim. The offering actually, um, it's not simply a, 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 you know, a matter of slaughtering the am animal and, and tossing it on the altar fire. There's a whole process of the slaughter, there's a whole process of how the, the animal is then uh, skinned and, and how it is, is uh, butchered, uh, carved up, what parts of the of the offering can be consumed and by whom. Some offerings are only the Kohanim can consume, other offerings the people who brought the offerings consume, certain parts are not for consumption, certain parts are displaced on the altar where they are burned on the altar. And um, it's uh, a whole thing and of course um, the blood from the different altars need to be uh, dashed on the altar. I can't believe that, uh, that our time is up. I was just getting into it. Wow. So much more to say. But we said a lot. I think so. I hope so. Thank you so much for being with me. This Temple Talk will be again next week, right before Passover. Thanks again, Temple Talk.